Uh, on behalf of everyone who has attended the summer school and the conference over the last uh, three weeks, I want to thank the organizers for this wonderful event. Uh, on behalf of everyone, maybe we give them a round of applause, particularly for Pierre, to Pierre and Erwan for the organization. I also have a proposal for future conferences. In future conferences, I propose that Diana be the last talk of the conference <laughs> because it's such a hard act to follow. So uh, we'll see where we get. OK. Uh, so uh, in this talk, uh, I'm going to have the same cartoon, same picture. I'll keep drawing the same picture for a uh, finite volume hyperbolic surface, so finite area with cusps and moduli spaces. So the picture will look like you have, you have the, the cusp geometry and then some topology in the compact piece. And that's the, that's the picture I will draw for all uh, as, a, as a cartoon for both, both these objects. The results when I state mostly will be uh, stated either for the modular surface, but basically the, the, the wor results work in full generality for, the, for modular space. OK. Uh, in general, so also as notation, I will let phi t be the geodesic flow. And which geodesic flow, I will tell you depending on the context. All right. Uh, so as a starting uh, point, I wanted to discuss um, the sullivan maser log loss. So uh, if you take a typical geodesic on a surface like that, then it's going to sort of wind around everywhere in the surface, make some excursions into the cusp, but keep returning back to the thick part. And the maser sullivan log law studies the behavior of how deep in the cusp do you go. Okay. So it's the asymptotic depth in the cusp. So this says that for a typical geodesic, for typical phi t of v, we get the following uh, behavior as the limb sub of, uh, of t going to infinity, we can measure the distance in the space between the starting vertex and the end vertex as a limb sum of this over log t, we get the answer one half. So the depth of the geodesic in the thin part is about half of log of t. And this works both on a surface like that, and Mazur showed that that also works in moduli space. OK. So the second part, I wanted to offer a simple heuristic. So let me just say a heuristic for, this, for the log law. And then maybe I'll get into more precise details uh, in, a, in a minute. So what's the heuristic? So let's draw a picture where we put one of these cusp neighborhoods at infinity. So I'm going to draw the picture in the upper half plane. So here is my picture. Uh, and now we have some horoballs based at infinity. The other lifts of the cusps become horoballs down here on the real line. And the fundamental domain in the cusp looks like that. And you get a horrible packing on R. And now he, in this picture, I want to take a region which is at some height. So let's take a region is between. So the imaginary part here is R. And here it's R over 2. I want to take, when you project down onto the surface, I want to take the region that looks like that here. And now, please don't laugh because I'm going to integrate and tell you what the area of that region is. So the, integ so the area of this region, and let's assume that the translation here, it looks like z goes to z plus 1. 
So the so the I want to evaluate the integral. Uh, this is between r over two and r zero to one dx dy or y squared. So this will, uh, if I do this correctly, so it's a one over r. Okay, that's the uh, area of this region. Okay, and now we want to study what you know a geodesic does. So a geodesic is going to pop through. The question we want to ask is whether it will cross this region or not. Okay, so where should I how should I put this region so that the geodesic does not cross, or where, and how low can it be so that the geodesic definitely will cross? Okay, so that's what we want to do. Okay, we want to get, we want to move this strip up and down, and get estimate in terms of t on whether the geodesic is forced to cross it or whether the geodesic has to avoid it. Okay, so let's uh, take a typical geodesic and ask ourselves: Well, how much time am I expected to spend in this region? So the time that a typical geodesic is expected to spend, well, it's just the integral. So let's fr be the characteristic function. So this is going to be the characteristic function of this region. And I'm just integrating the characteristic function between 0 to t. This is going to be fr of phi t of v dt. Right? That's roughly, that's the time that you spend in this region. And if we are, uh, what we expect this to be, and this will be made precise later, this should be t times the area of the region, right? So this will be, which we computed, this should be t times one over r. Okay. So now here is how you build a heuristic. Now imagine, so imagine now we can put in this relationship uh, r to be something like t to the power one minus epsilon. Okay. In that case, the time spent will look like t divided by t to the power one minus epsilon. So it's about, so the time, in that case, we'll get a time, expected time, to be t to epsilon, which as, a, as t goes to infinity, becomes larger and larger. Now notice that in this region, just by, by hyperbolic geometry, the length of this piece is at least log one half log two. It's a definite thing, the way I have constructed this strip. So if this time, is becoming really large, that means we are forced to do an excursion of this size, okay? So that would give us the lower bound on the, on the maximum excursion that, that happens till time t, all right? So, and now imagine, this was the first case, now in the second case, imagine we take r to be too large, so it's t one plus epsilon, in that case, the time spent is about t to the minus epsilon, which goes to zero. So at some point, it will be less than one half log two, which means that beyond that time, we will not see any excursions of this size. So that gives us the bounds, both upper and lower bounds, for the size of the largest excursion. Any questions? Or how this, okay, so there's a big thing that I have not justified here, which is this arrow. What does this arrow really mean? Uh, it's going to be one half because my hyperbolic metric is going to be like take. So if you take this and you apply, so this is my height. Take uh, one half log of this. You'll see the one. You know, you get exactly one half out of it. Yeah. So it's you know whether you want hyperbolic metric to be curvature minus one or minus four. No, you know, you can be very precise with this. Okay. So now I have to justify this bit here. What does that mean? So this heuristic would actually become an argument if we could get what is the rate expected in this, exp in this expression. So if, for example, if I could get uh, you know, t times, so this is, what is this quantity? This is the L1 norm of fr. So if I could get uh, 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 an effective ergodic, what I'm doing here is I'm applying, trying to apply the ergodic theorem, but if I could get rates in that ergodic theorem, then I would have something like this. I could get bounds, uh, and I'll tell you in a minute what these bounds will look like. So it will turn out to look like that. 
prove some bounds like that less than or equal to this integral which is going to be less than or equal to now just with the first plus okay so if you could prove something like this then the, it turns out well as long as this term remains smaller than that leading term this heuristic becomes an actual bound so first idea would be prove such a theorem and then just use this on this particular heuristic and that would give you the give you the bounds so where does such a theorem come from it comes from knowing exponential mixing of the flow so we need exponential decay of correlations uh, in the case for hyperbolic surfaces this is moore and rackner uh and in the case of moduli spaces it's avila and gozel uh one important point i want to make here is that the functions that we are considering are living downstairs on the surface so they are k invariant they are so2 invariant and for so2 invariant functions you have stronger exponential decay uh stronger correlations uh, for uh, for such functions so once you set this up this heuristic actually becomes an argument and in fact you can bounds of the following form so you can prove that the the imaginary part of the maximal excursion can will live between 1 over log t square uh imaginary part of e max the maximal excursion and will be bounded about by t over log t square okay you can put prove bounds like this just so the the approach is well here here is our heuristic will prove an effective ergodic theorem using the exponential decay of correlations and apply it in this heuristic and that gets get those bounds there is a subtle point here it there isn't a, it is it isn't a fixed function that we are getting the effective ergodic theorem for our function is a time dependent entity because you see as as my t becomes larger this strip has to be pushed further and further up so it's an effective ergodic theorem for a family of functions which are sort of type which are time dependent in the controlled way yeah there's a question okay yeah so you if you get an effective yeah this is just the ergodic theorem is saying the time spent is equal to t times l1 norm but you want a, a, an actually error term a control on the error term in that l1 norm yeah Yeah so this is the effective ergodic theorem this here this here is the effective ergodic theorem that you can prove using exponential decay of correlations by Moore Ratner and Avila Guza and once you do that you make your choices of r where you then you can start estimating the time more precisely spent in this strip and you make those choices to get these bounds okay so if you put r over log t square then you will see that uh the lower bound produces something which is goes to infinity again that means there must be an excursion of this size and then if you put r is equal to that quantity then it means that the uh the upper bound goes to zero so there's too little time spent in this trip eventually asymptotically zero which means for all large times beyond a certain point the uh, uh there will be no excursion of of that scale okay so right and uh, so this you can do uh, of course in moduli spaces as well and yeah uh up okay so now i want to compare this to the theory of continued fractions as a special case that lives in sort of both worlds okay we will go going to take those bounds and and can compare this with what you see in continued fractions so in the theory of continued fractions there is this whole kinchin theory about how uh, once you understand coefficients in a in a typical continuation expansion so the first theorem i wanted to sort of mention here is the theorem by borel and bernstein which says that along a typical continued fraction an will be larger than n log n log, log n for infinitely many n okay that's some expression i put in there i will tell you the 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 general statement in in a minute uh so this is satisfied for infinitely many n now let's look at this bound and compare it with that bound there on the right hand side 
See, uh, it's, it's t log t log log t, whereas we have t log t squared. So it's so you're sort of really limiting where our excursions are landing. Uh, in the general statement here is this inequality is satisfied as long as the sequence I can put over here, uh, if that sequence is divergent, one over that uh, number is the, uh, the sequence that you get, the series that you get by putting one over that number is divergent, then this is satisfied of infinitely many n. If it's convergent, then it's satisfied for at most finitely many n. Okay? That's the, that's the dichotomy that you get in this theorem. And you can sort of see those bounds kind of reflect that a little bit. Uh, yeah, so the right hand produce a sequence here, Sn. And if you know, so you want to know whether this is true. Uh, this is true if and only if it's true for infinitely many n, if and only if 1 over Sn, this, this series diverges. OK? And if the series converges, then only for finitely many n. Sorry? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be very precise, yeah. So that's the, that's the, that's the dichotomy. Okay, uh, so the next thing you could ask, well, let's forget about the largest, like this is sort of saying that, you know, we're looking at the largest, how large can the coefficient be? We could start asking about the average coefficient. Okay, so now instead of looking at just the largest one, I'm going to add up all my coefficients and divide by n. So if you do that, you see that the average coefficient along a typical continued fraction goes to infinity. That's because a continued fraction as a random variable is, uh, has an infinite expectation. Okay? So that, that's, that's the reason why you get this divergence. And again, you can prove analogs of that, first for a general hyperbolic surface like that, and second for moduli spaces, where you can estimate the total excursion up to time t uh, so the, what's the average excursion up to time t along a typical type of geodesic? And that's divergent. So this, is a, this was joint work with Joseph Marr and Giulio Tiozzo, where we proved the, uh, that the analog of the Gauss law actually works in uh, the general setting of moduli spaces. And now, once you know this kind of expression, where you know that the, uh, that the sum of the coefficients, uh, the average coefficient is divergent, you could try to guess well, what is the growth rate of this quantity. And you know, if you play around with the distribution for continued fractions, you would get that it's log, it, it grows like log n. So maybe when you, instead of dividing by n, you should divide by n log n, and then maybe you have a limit that way. So it turns out, this first one is going to bust that. If I were to try to divide by n log n, this is already producing a single coefficient, which is big beating the quantity you want. Okay, so there is no hope of getting a, a, a strong law if you put n log n. What you can get is a, is a law in limit, in, in the measure. So the measure where you see your quantity diverge from the expected average by more than epsilon, that measure goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So it's a weak law. Okay, so you don't get the expected limit uh, as a strong law. So what's the obstruction? The obstruction turns out to be that these continued fraction coefficients behave wildly once in a while. They just become really huge at some point. So what you should do is you should truncate off something, and the thing you truncate off is exactly the largest coefficient. So once you truncate off the largest coefficient and divide by n log n, then you actually get a strong law. Okay? So these were theorems by Kinchin. The weak law was a theorem by Kinchin. And then Diamond and Balor, which one, I believe number theory has proved this, this strong law uh, for, for continued fractions. Now, it, you know, you look at these, when I first read these theorem statements, like, uh, you think, oh, these are special to continued fractions, but why should they be? I mean, you can always think of continued fractions as the, as, as the data you glean from looking at geodesics on the modular surface. So you can try to generalize the picture, and it turns out, well, actually, the whole thing does generalize. So the final general statement I just want to put on the board is that if you have an affine invariant manifold n, which is an, an orbit closure for the SL2R action, uh, we have a SL2R invariant ergodic measure supported on, uh, on n in the Lebesgue measure class. If you specify some thin part, so imagine you've specified 
you know, a certain sequence of n parallel saddle connections that you want short, if you specify some thin part, then you could set up a similar quantity. Well, what is this measuring? We, it's measuring, it's adding up the excursions in this particular thin part as a function of t. So you read, let your random geodesic go on for time t, you add up all the excursions, then you dock off the largest excursion, divide by t log t, and what you recover in the limit is some is the Siegel which constant up to some uh, some universal constants. So you can read off like the the asymptotic volume behavior of the thin part from a from something along a purely random geodesic. Okay, so there is a, exactly sort of the same kind of behavior going on. It's really these these things these things on the right on the left should be thought of as properties of SL2, SL2 or action. That's my, that's, that's the point I want to make. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so what I will do is I have some thin part. So I have uh, a typical geodesic. So you look at the Teichmuller disk and you intersect that thin part with your Teichmuller disk. And that will be a horrible collection in your Teichmuller disk. Maybe not a packing. You no, know, there could be intersections. And then you, as you may make your way through the horrible, you sort of exponentiate the time that you spend in that horrible. And those will be the analogs of AN. And you do that. So you can also re reformulate this in terms of the of the integral system. There are other reformulations of this. Yes, yes. The one that sort of got the deepest in. Yeah. And exponentiate the time spent on that path and you dock it off. And then you get the Siegel which constant. Uh, which, so this, it's not clear where this 1 over log 2 is, but basically what I'm saying is if you take these, these you should think of these as discrete analogs of continuous statements. If you were to convert this uh, statement to, uh, instead of, you convert the n into t along a modular surface then you will get exactly the, uh, the cusp volume for the forward packing of the modular surface. So you, there is a way to recover this statement from that statement for the special case of the modular surface by converting T back into N. Yes? Absolutely right, yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's, I mean, this is related to the, you know, you expect how the, you have the volume decay of the thin part, you know how it works. So this, if you set this exponential up as a, as a, as a variable and you take its L1 norm, its L1 norm is infinite. So this is some kind of ergodic average. It should converge to its L1 norm. We know that the L1 norm is infinite. You can, you, we can reformulate this in terms of systems as well. I mean, uh, this is, I thought I wanted to, Present it to exact, keep the exact parallel between the two stories. Okay, so that's the kind of leverage you get just from doing some very simple heuristic like that. Okay, so all I'm doing is I have some appropriately defined functions on the thin part, and I'm applying effective ergodic theory to study those. Okay, so now uh, that's good. I st what time did I start? Okay, that's that's perfect. I think I'm 12, yeah? yeah? Okay, good. So now I want to talk about, which was number, whatever it is, four, I think. So that takes care of the Teichmuller metric. Uh, well, I'm, well, maybe one more remark I wanted to say here. The, the other issue that you have to analyze here is related to Ben's talk, which is that you, your excursions now are simultaneous because your thin parts have intersections. So you are, at some point you might be doing simultaneous excursions which could in principle blow up, your, blow up your sum and you have to control that contribution basically. And to control that contribution you use bend the regularity of the measure. That if, there, if you're doing two simultaneous excursions then the probability of that is like the square of the corresponding thin parts in, term, in terms of measure. So that's much more less likely than, than, than the sort of doing one excursion at a time. 
Okay, so you use the regularity of the measure to control that. Like you could have, you know, you could have two, you know, you could have one system of saddle connections, which is really, you could have two sort of, here is one system of parallel saddle connections that are almost vertical, and the second, which is also in a different, you know, non-parallel -par to the first one, but they're both roughly the same slope, so they both become thin at the same time, and then now you're doing two excursions at the same time. What's the, the contribution to the sum coming from such terms? So you have to use the regularity of the measure. Good. Okay. Uh, well, I was hoping that this would give us a computational scheme to compute Siegel which constants directly without any recursions, because you could, you know, simulate what a, what a random geodesic looks like using interval exchanges or whatever, and then estimate all the systems up to time t and use this to compute Siegel which constants. But I think I've dropped the idea. <laughs> I think the, the convergence is not fast enough for that. OK. So now I'm going to change track and talk about a different metric. So since in this entire two weeks that I've been here, no one def defined the Weil-Peterson metric, I will not do so either. I have the advantage of being the very last speaker. So it's like, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to show you is basically a picture of the cusp geometry. Okay, so I'm going to say some words here without actually defining the metric. So DWP on moduli space, this is an incomplete Riemannian metric, uh, negatively curved Riemannian metric. on M. Uh, so what I want to really make a point about is the cusp geometry. And so let's think of the modular surface and what does the metric look like on the cusp. So the metric on the cusp looks like the following. So you take the graph of y is equal to x cubed and then you take the surface of revolution that you get from this curve. So look at this gadget. So this is the surface of revolution in R3. Now restrict the metric on R3, from R3 to this surface of revolution. What you get is a negatively curved metric on the surface of revolution. That's the, that's the asymptotic geometry of the cusp of modular surface in the, with the way it is. So one thing to note here is that the curvature here actually goes to minus infinity as we go closer to the cusp. As the distance, say, if you are at this point, well, at this point, so this is the distance delta, as delta goes to 0. OK, and uh, the incompleteness comes from the following fact. So the incompleteness comes from the fact that if I take, if I sit at this point and head out to the cusp, then the, then the distance required to reach the cusp is finite. So the cusp is a really finite distance away, unlike in the hyperbolic metric, which you have to keep going forever. So uh, the, the corresponding model for the hyperbolic metric would be to take the surface of revolution of e to the minus x. Okay, if you take the surface of revolution of that, that's the hyperbolic cusp. Okay, um, for a good comparison between the Teichmuller metric and the uh, Way Peterson metric, I'm going to put this, this cusp geometry in the same model, which is the upper half space model. So uh, let me just do that. Low enough. There we go. So in, let's put what DWP in the neighborhood of the cusp looks like in the upper half space model. This looks like dx dy over y cubed. So that's the difference, y square, y cubed. And now if you, have, if, if you take a, a, a segment which goes vertically off to infinity, you're trying to integrate dy over y to the power 3 over 2. That has a finite answer.
So before I start talking about random WP geodesics, I'm, I have to first tell you what does the flow mean. It's an incomplete metric space, so you could worry that you know, a, a positive measure set of geodesics just run into the completion and stop. So it turns out that doesn't happen. Uh, this, the set of geodesic rays that uh, stop at the completion points is measure 0. So the flow can be defined because almost every geodesic continues on forever. And there is an invariant measure for this. So there's a flow invariant measure for, for, for this flow. So the WP flow in some is, 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 is well defined. So I'm going to consider the WP flow and uh, consider random geodesics for the WP flow. Okay, so maybe I erase. Actually, I want to keep some of this on the board. Uh, what should I keep? Uh, let's see. Okay, to erase this. Okay. Um, so now we. I should also tell you what their what is known about their ergodic theory of the of the of the flow. So their ergodic properties is of of the WP flow. So the WP flow is ergodic. This was flow is ergodic. Uh, this is proved for modular spaces like the modular surface by Polycott and Weiss. And in the general case by Burns, Mazur and Wilkinson. So this is for general moduli spaces. Uh, now we could ask about, well, one of the ingredients we needed was always mixing of the flow because that is the ingredient needed to prove effective ergodic theory. So <clears throat> about the mixing results, so uh, in, the, in the exceptional modular case, so on the modular surface, for example, uh, the flow is exponentially mixing. This is a result of Burns, uh, Mazur, Matthias, and Wilkinson. And in the, and the general case for non-exceptional modular spaces, uh, WP flow is it's so it's open. It's not known. Is at we there's only a bound more known. It's at most t to the minus seven mixing. So in the decay of correlations, when you write down the decay of correlations, the term that shows up in dependent on t is t at most t to the minus one over t to the seven. Okay. So this was proved by again Burns, Mazur, Matthias, Wilkinson. So if, so if you want to analyze cusp excursions of random geodesics, of course we can say very concrete things about the second case. We can say make conditional statements in the third case. So let's see. Uh, let me get rid. Of, let me get rid of this. So in the second case, so analog of the log law. So analog. So bounds for. Uh, let me write it this way. Bounds for the maximal excursion. And this is joint worth with, with, with Carlos Matthias, who I see that left the room a minute ago. So, what are the bounds? And I'm going to use the piece of paper. 
seem to have lost the piece of paper. Ah, there it is. So what I'm going to write the bounds in terms of putting both metrics in the upper half space model in the cusp up there so that we can compare them. So in terms of these coordinates for the cusp, the bounds are as follows. So on the modular surface, it is T1 minus epsilon. So for any epsilon, you can beat this basically. So this is less than the imaginary part of the maximal excursion, so E max in the, in the WP world which is less than T1 plus epsilon to the 3. And so for comparison, uh, comparison there was, yeah, T1 minus epsilon, T1 plus epsilon. These, these bounds suggest that the, which is, was surprising to me when we got the answer, was that the largest WP excursion is actually shallower. It's often repeated that, you know, because of the way the cusp geometry is, like if you look at this metric, it's so easy to head near the cusp and twist around and come back out. But that's to construct geodesics. A random geodesic actually avoids the cusp. And the reason for that is, if you take this metric and you start looking at the cusp volume, you know, take imaginary part of Z bigger than or equal to R, and you start estimating the cusp volume, that decays much faster. So in that sense, the cusp repels your random geodesic, and in fact, the maximal excursion is shorter. I mean, you, there is other ways to see this. For example, you can think of the vertical segment that goes off to the cusp, straight to the cusp in this new metric. And it turns out that this, this vertical segment, because the curvature is going to minus infinity, is, ra is rather unstable. So if you perturb by theta along the vertical, your resulting excursion is much shallower. The cusp so this is, uh, it's, it, the, the, the maximal excursion is much shorter for the, for the WP metric on the modular surface. Uh, this is for, for case number two. And in case number three, the theorem we have is the following. So in case number three, I'm not going to write the precise statement. I'm just going to say that uh, assuming we have at least lean, you know, super linear mixing. So it has to be T minus one uh, plus, you could have smaller functions there, but let me put it as T one minus one plus epsilon. So it's just T to the minus, at most T to the minus. Seven. So the, if this is, if the flow is mixing T to one minus one plus epsilon mixing for the general moduli spaces, then we have bounds. So it needs to at least mix linearly. Uh, that's still an open problem. How? What is the exact rate of mixing for the WP flow? Uh, I mean, our guess is that it is actually, but we'll see about it. Uh, <clears throat> One more thing I want to, okay. So the strategy of proof of this uh, quite mirrors that. So you set up these sets, which kind of measure the excursions that you're doing. And now you want to know how much time do you actually spend in these sets. So again, you want to apply the ergodic theorem. So you want to say, well, it, the time you spent in these sets is, is t times the L1 norm of the set. But with an error term, which gets controlled by the rate of mixing. And because the, the rate of mixing uh, in, the, in, a, in, in the general case is very slow, you don't expect to get really sharp bounds anyway, because of the strategy. Oh, I should also mention, I, I said here that uh, I'm saying that the maximal excursion for the WP metric is shallower. What that's comparison is a little fraught. It's shallower, the comparison uses the time parameter. You need to know that if you take a random WP geodesic and you flow for time t, I need to know how much progress in the hyperbolic metric have I made. Have I made linear progress? Because you want to set up the same time parameter for comparison. And it turns out you can actually show that a WP path makes linear progress in, in the hyperbolic distance. And then that com comparison becomes completely valid. And the way to do this is to note that 
if you take a WP path, as you flow it along, it's in the thick part. In the thick part, the matrix are comparable because the sectional curvatures are bounded for the WP matrix. So in the thick part, your segments are going to be quasi-geodesic in the, in the hyperbolic matrix. And in the thin parts, you just need to understand what is the contribution coming from the cusp, cusp excursions. But because they are shallower, you're really not getting a lot more in the WP matrix. In fact, if a, the contribution from the, uh, from the cusp to the hyperbolic distance is actually less in the WP matrix than in the hyperbolic matrix. So that way you can construct, you know, you can show that the hyperbolic distance actually grows linearly along a WP path. Now, of course, one wants to do the similar thing in the in Teichmuller space, take a WP geodesic in Teichmuller space. Well, how does Teichmuller distance grow along a WP geodesic in Teichmuller space? And that should also be, again, linear, but okay, that's one needs control on subsurface projections and so on to do that. Okay, so that's perfect. And then now the last bit of the talk. Uh, are there any questions about WP? Oh, I should, one other thing I wanted to mention. One could also take, in WP world, one could also take, uh, this is the maximal one, one could also take the average excursion. How do you measure the average excursion? Well, you set up the sum of the winding numbers. So you do a WP excursion, you take the winding number corresponding to that excursion, add them all up, uh, up to time t, and then divide by t. It turns out, for that, you get behavior where this is actually this is bounded. The average coefficient, so uh, 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 an easier way to state this is that if you take a WP geodesic on the modular surface, the average coefficient that you see along this geodesic is actually bounded, unlike the hyperbolic uh, metric. Which is also, you know, if you think about WP metric, it's like, it seems like, oh, it's so easy to wind around the cusp. In fact, the length spectrum is omega to the omega, but the, uh, the, you know, the random geodesic somehow actually avoids the cusp. So there is only one way, I mean, it's known, you can construct sets which have measure. Yeah, we, the, the rate can at most be t to the minus. So what is the decay of correlations? You are putting some function which decays in terms of time. And the function that you can put on the right is, is, is at least as slow as t to the minus 7. And one doesn't know the bound the other way, right? I mean. You will have some, you know, so you will have some functional norms here, and then you are doing something like f, uh, and then you are taking, let's say, with itself or, or g, phi t of v, and then you are integrating that, right? In uh, setting up the decay of correlations, you will get t to the, you will get a function here which is decaying slower than t one over t to the seven. You look. It, it, it is topologically mixing, okay. I think. I don't know who the result is due to, but, but it, the actual rate of mixing is not known yet. It's really slowly mixing, that much is known, but what is the lower bound? It's yeah, it's a, neg it's a negative result. So you should think of this as a negative result, yeah. Um, <clears throat> should still be, I mean, the, the Guess is that it's still at least, you know, it's not any slower than 1 over t. Okay. Uh, where was I? Okay, so that's Teichmuller metric WP flow. And now the last bit is random box. Are there any questions about WP? So this is setup number what else? six. So there is there are other ways to sample random geodesics on moduli spaces. 
So I've given you two models where you could use the type model metric to get a random geodesic on modulized space. You could use the WP metric to get a random geodesic on modulized space. The third way to do this is to do the following. So we're going to get take a random walk on the mapping class group. So what does that mean? I'm going to generate uh, the, the sample path of size n as follows. So you take a random product like that, where each gi is sampled by some initial distribution of the group. So what do we do? Well, one way to think about it is the mapping class group is finitely generated. Let's pick a set of generators and let's just do a nearest neighbor random walk, which means at each step, you know, we we toss a coin or whatever equal with faces equal to the number of generators that will tell us which generator to pick. You multiply that on the right, and you keep doing that. That will generate a random word of length n. That's w n. So if you do this. Here is the picture that you get. Here is type Muller space. To generate this random element, I could pick a base point x and continue. Like in step one, I might go there, then I could go somewhere else, then I could go somewhere else, then I could go somewhere else, I could go somewhere else. So that's a random walk. You project your random walk into type Muller space. Now, Kaiman, Novich, and Mazur showed that this process converges to the boundary. So, for almost every sample path, the sequence that we generated, Wn of x, actually converges to a point in the Thurston boundary of Teichmuller space, it's PMF. Uh, reason is roughly speaking, I mean, imagine you were doing this random walk on the hyperbolic plane. So you would start at a point and you would head off in some direction. And once you're at, in, you've made progress in one direction, it's really hard to backtrack. You can't really go back very easily. So you continue to make progress forward and forward and eventually you converge to the boundary. Oh, how this works. So the same, I mean, the, the big result, the same kind of thing happens in Teichmuller space when you project this random walk into Teichmuller space. Yeah. Oh, yes, of course there is, but should I state it? The, the support of the measure should be a non-elementary subgroup of the mapping class group. So which means that the support of the measure, should, as when you take the group, it should contain independent pseudo-onosome elements. Once you do that, then the random walk has good convergence to the bound. And now if you want to know more properties, then you need to start putting moment conditions on the initial distribution. I, I don't want to say anything more than that. Is, that. is that okay? We can chat later. So when you get convergence like that, you get a measure on the boundary. So because of this convergence, now we have defined there is a harmonic measure. This defines a measure new on PMF. And what we are going to do is basically we have this measure on PMF. It's supported on unique ergodic guys, supported on UE. So we can sit at a point and pull all of that measure back to the unit area quadratic differentials at this base point, and to the cotangent space at this point, because they're all supported on the unique ergodic guys. The support of the measure is on the unique so that way we have now, we have a base point and we have a measure on our unit tangent bond, unit tangent space at that point. We can sample a geodesic ray using that measure. So now we, this allows us to, so let me write it here. So, this gives us a way to sample geodesic rays. So we now have a different notion of, so we have now a different notion of a random geodesic on modulized space, which comes from this, this mechanism. And then you could ask again the same question. So we have this geodesic, well, does first question would be, does it do cusp excursions? 
and provided that your group actually has elements in there, the support of your, of your, of your random walk has reducible elements in there, it will make excursions. If the support of your random walk is purely pseudonymous or convex co compact, you might not actually go into the thin part at all. So as long as you put an extra assumption that it contains a reducible, then it will do go into the thin part. And then you could ask the same question, well, what is the max, what, is, what are the bounds on the maximal excursion? And with work in progress with, with, jo, uh, with Joseph Maher, we show, so now again, bounds for maximal excursion. Uh, for this particular scheme, uh, they, are ten, they are of the form one over k log log t less than the maximal excursion, so E max uh, k log log t. Again, we don't have sharp limits, but we have bounds. So where does the double log come in? So let me quickly explain that from a simpler model of this picture. Okay, so <clears throat> how does one see the two logs? So imagine that we are doing an S a, a random walk on SL to Z, which is the pi one of the modular surface in the following way. So we take the following two generators. So we take as an example. So imagine we take the generators one, one, zero, one, and one, one, the two parabolic generators for, so take this group. We know this is SL to Z. And now for simplicity, imagine that we are doing a non-backtracking random walk in the generator. So which means I'm not allowing the inverses. I'm just going forward along, along the, in the semi-group generated by these generators. So that's, what's, what does that give us? The, roughly speaking, what it gives us is the following. So we have two choices. Let's call this left and right. So what we will do is we'll have some, we'll produce uh, this WN that we'll produce will look like something like this. So it will be R, several copies, you know, some copies of R. Let me just sort of write something down. So L, 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 R, L, L, R, 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 something like that. That's a random word which you'll get from this process. I'm just choosing R and L randomly. So then what you do is you take this and you read off as coefficients. And this keeps going. And now you make a continued fraction expansion out of this. So you get 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over, and so on. Okay, so I'm doing heads and tails. I'm looking at sequences of consecutive heads and consecutive tails. From that, I'm getting a continued fraction expansion. And when you do that, so you, you can sort of write down what this function looks like, and it looks like Minkowski question mark function. It's, it's, it's a strictly, when you take the interval and you do this, you will get a strictly monotonic function. So take a binary expansion of points in the interval and convert that into continued fraction expansion. You'll get a strictly monotonic function on the interval, which is differentiable nowhere, almost nowhere. So the derivative, yeah, I should, I should have said, yeah, that's the more precise statement. The, the, the derivative of this function is zero almost everywhere. So once you have this function, well, you could take the Lebesgue measure on the interval and push it forward by this function, and you'll get a new measure which is singular with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And that's this measure new. That's a, like a good model to think about for this measure new. And now the question is, well, we're doing excursions. Well, what does excursion mean? Remember the way continued fraction coefficients are associated with excursions. The coefficients are, as Paul said, they are measuring the exponential of the time spent in the thin part. So if you have this scheme of producing your coefficients, then we are looking at the largest bit of consecutive Rs or consecutive Ls. So if I'm doing this for n number of times, what is the size of the largest bit? The largest bit looks like log n. So we have the largest coefficient looks like log n, so the depth in the thin part looks like log log n. So I, I should have said this should be depth, but anyway. So that's how you get these kind of bounds. So in general, what will replace, what will take the role of these coefficients? How do you get these bounds? Well, we have to control the subsurface projection that you get along a sample path. 
So you, have, you know that you have reducible elements in the support of your random walk, and you want to understand subsurface project sets with large projections in, these, in, in this setup. So what's the ergodic setup being used? You formulate this entire problem as uh, in terms of the shift map on, mo on, the, on the mapping class group, uh, on Z copies of the mapping class group. So you take this map, this measure new, can be thought of as a measure on this, on this space, and it's ergodic with respect to sigma. And then you need some independence results for these various sets that you're looking at. And then again, effective ergodic theorem for this, the same, same strategy. Okay, I think I'll stop here.